Before we get started, I'd like to make a couple announcements. First, I would like to welcome Patricia Martin. She is a cultural analyst, author, consultant, professional affiliate, meaning a graduate of our two-year Jungian Studies program, and a current member of our program committee. This is the first interview she's doing for us, and uh, we are currently developing plans to do more, and I'm just so grateful that she's willing to give her own time to help us bring more interesting discussions to the podcast. Also, our Cyber Monday sale will begin on November 25th and run through November 30th. So during that period, all audio and video downloads, including recordings for this year's online webinars, will be 40% off. So if there's anything you're thinking about getting now, you're welcome to hold off for another two weeks uh, until the sale begins. Finally, we are currently accepting applications for our analyst training program. So if you are thinking about becoming a Jungian analyst, want to learn more, download an application, or get some contact information for the current director of training who's open to answering any of your questions about the training program itself, just visit our website, jungchicago.org. You can also click the link in the show notes that goes directly to the analyst training program page. Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, Analytical Psychology Seminars from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. In this episode, Patricia Martin interviews Boris Matthews, current director of the Analyst Training Program at the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago, about his own life journey, his perspective on analysis, education, individuation, and the program itself. Boris Matthews graduated from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago, is a member of the Chicago Society of Jungian Analysts, and maintains a practice of analytical psychology in the Milwaukee and Madison, Wisconsin areas. He is particularly interested in working with persons who recognize the need to develop a balanced adaptation to the outside and to the inside worlds, work that involves awareness of the individual's psychological typology. Dreams, active imagination, and spiritual concerns are integral elements in the analytic work, the ultimate goal of which is to develop a functioning dialogue with the non-ego center, the self. He serves as the director of training of the Analyst Training Program, regularly teaches classes for analytic candidates, and conducts study groups. He uh, also taught this past year, he taught an online program called 2020 in Turmoil, a Jungian astrological perspective, and that program is currently available for digital download in our online store. Patricia Martin is a noted cultural analyst, author, and consultant. She has published three books on cultural trends. As a consultant, Patricia has helped some of the world's most respected organizations interpret social signals that have the power to shape the collective. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Harvard Business Review, USA Today, and Advertising Age. She holds an MA in Literature and Cultural Studies at the University College of Dublin and a BA in English from Michigan State University. In 2018, she completed the Union Studies Program at the C.G. Young Institute of Chicago, where she is a professional affiliate. A scholar in residence at the Chicago Public Library, Patricia has devoted nearly a decade to studying digital culture and its impacts on individuation. She lectures around the world on topics related to the psyche and the digital age, the future of the collective, and the changing nature of individuation, all concepts discussed in her forthcoming book, Will the Future Like You? 
I also want to note that there was some mysterious background hum that uh, I did my best to remove, but the audio quality is affected slightly. Uh, I'll continue to work on improving the audio quality for these interviews and appreciate your patience as this uh, venture develops a little more and uh, we get better at doing it. Uh, so now here's the interview. Hello, my name is Patricia Martin, and I'm a researcher and an author and a professional affiliate at the C.G. Young Institute in Chicago. Today I have with me Boris Matthews. He's the director of training at the C.G. Young Institute, where he leads the analyst training program. Boris is a highly respected Jungian scholar, a teacher, and he has translated Carl Jung's ideas into books and lectures for worldwide audiences. Welcome, Boris. It's great to have you with us today. Well, thank you. I I appreciate your taking time to do this. Oh, I'm thrilled to get the chance to talk to you. Uh, we'll be talking today about the Jungian path to uh, becoming an analyst and what makes it unique from other types of psychotherapy. And uh, how about if we just begin with your own journey? How did you find your way to Jung? Indirectly, um, I think in graduate school, I was already uh, thinking in Jungian terms, although I didn't know it at the time. And I did a couple of graduate school papers uh, interpreting the uh, or translating some of the symbolism in a novel. And my grad professor gave me a B, which, of course, you know, in grad school, a B is a failing grade. It's, it's a warning. <laughs> and then uh, I was trying to be an expatriate. Yeah, which I didn't succeed at. I gave it a three-year shot and just, you know, couldn't pull it off. But anyway, in that first year out of the country, I had, uh, in the winter, I had a major dream, which woke me in the middle of the night. And uh, I knew that there was something uh, significant there. So I uh, stopped in at a uh, clinic on my way to the job that I was doing at the time and uh, turned out to be the, the Jungian clinic in Stuttgart, Germany. And then it took, you know, several years to actually do anything more about it. But I discovered then, um, man, uh, what is it? Man and his symbols and, uh, that early book by Demet and Kleitman on uh, REM sleep. And, uh, then, uh, memories, dreams, reflections, and I was hooked. And it took a few years after that to actually to get into analysis and, then finally get into training. But that, that initial dream that uh, has really been, uh, I guess, formative, but also uh, when everything comes back to what am I doing, the dream really tells me, you know, what I'm trying to do. Well, how Jungian that yeah, you I know. could have found yourself at a crossroads and then had a dream mm -hmm. that started to indicate maybe you should go this direction. Is that common? I mean, why do therapists turn to Jung after they've been out and practicing for a while? I think one of the reasons that therapists turn to Jung after they've been practicing a while is that they uh, realize that they've gone as far as they can go with their conventional uh, uh, approaches and techniques. And I'm not at all downgrading the value of a lot of the conventional uh, approaches to psychotherapy. A lot of it is really what the client needs uh, at the time. But, you know, you, you, you get to a point where, especially if um, dreams are coming up, which doesn't necessarily be a topic of discussion in, in some of the conventional therapies, but if the client is having dreams and the therapist can't deal with them and the dreams are bothersome and it doesn't make any sense to try to interpret them only in terms of uh, uh, interpersonal relationships or, or working or home situations, then, you know, you got to find something else. Then my initial dream wouldn't have made a bit of sense um, from a typical um uh, this worldly point of view. You know, I, I'm i thinking as I'm listening to you that 
that would really be a major difference in how Jung saw the analytic process versus, for instance, uh, Freud, mm. in, in that it was really the unconscious plays a very big role in analysis. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and how you train analysts to surface some of that. Good question, Patricia. The uh, One of the major differences between Jung and other people is his position that the organism as a whole is a uh, self-regulating uh, entity, if you will. Um, psyche and soma together are self-regulating. And they are uh, uh, growing... Uh, Toward some sort of full manifestation. All right. Now, to translate that abstraction, uh, the acorn, whether it knows it or not, is going to be an oak tree. And, uh, regardless of, unless it's killed along the way, you know, uh, it's going to whatever shape it takes. It'll deal with the weather. It'll deal with the animals. It'll deal with people, but it's going to be an oak tree. And so uh, this is one of the fundamental positions in Jung's view, which has always been appealing to me, that uh, life is purposive, purposeful, purposive, whatever the right uh, adjectival form <laughs> is, right? Yep. Now, I still haven't answered the question of what's the purpose of life. And? And, nevertheless, uh, there is that... Uh, point of view, the telos, T-E-L-O-S, you know, the, uh, it's, it's headed toward somewhere, not just the grave. And, and uh, there is evidence in Jung's writings and the writings of other analytical psychologists. There's rich evidence for me, in any case, from uh, near-death experiences, where people have actually been clinically dead out of their bodies. Everything is shut down, heartbeat, brain waves. They've been clinically dead, and yet they come back and they can tell what they experienced out of body, you know. Um, so life in the body is not the end of it. And uh, you, well, I think we're at a, we'll get to this later, but we're at a point in time when perhaps more and more people are asking this question about purpose, personal purpose. Why are we here? What are we doing? Uh, I don't think we have good answers yet. Uh, so back back to the unconscious. Well, um, the consciousness is not the whole story. So that there's a lot that the organism self regulates in a very dynamic way, without our ever noticing it. Okay, what we do notice are certain things like thirst, hunger, fatigue. Okay, boredom, curiosity. Um, but also dreams that come in picture form or story in picture form, which optimally we need to uh, understand as well as we can, because the dream offers information if we can understand it. So the unconscious, what's out? Okay. The unconscious is not a place. It's not a thing. It's really a statement about my Awareness by my conscious knowledge. So I am unconscious of X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Is it the X, Y, and Z unconscious? I don't know, but I'm unconscious of it. And so surfacing that kind of thing is through dream work. And I'm guessing uh, the program might teach uh, an analyst how to do or encourage active imagination. Um, ways, methods that Carl Jung practiced to help tap into some of that in the unconscious, raise it to consciousness. And so um, I think this is what Jung would say is the whole route to individuation, which is to, you know, be able to be a fully integrated person. Do I have that right? 
Uh, essentially, yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, active imagination. And uh, I like to uh, talk about it, at least initially, by saying, by asking the other person, do you ever talk to yourself? Gosh, and I do all the time. And the other answers, you know. You get up in the morning, what am I going to do today? And after a while, something comes to mind. You get an answer to the question. Now, it's if active imagination can be a very demanding discipline. As demanding as talking with uh, uh, another human being who has a point of view that uh, they insist on. All right. Mm-hmm. It's now Jung said that most direct access to what's outside of consciousness is through fantasy and imagination. Okay, it's not idle daydreaming. It's serious imagining, just as serious as talking with somebody uh, whose opinion uh, may be important to you. So, yeah, in training, that's part of it. So you were for a while the director of training, and yep. then you took a hiatus from it, mm-hmm. and then you, you're you returning now. Mm-hmm. And so I'm guessing that some things have changed in the world in between those those periods when you were the director of training. And so how do you see that and how has the program adapted to sort of meet the present moment? I think actually, as I'm finishing my uh, second uh, four year round of the director of training, uh, there's more change that I observe than in the previous years. Uh, This is a good question because it raises the question of what is happening on the planet, okay? How far back do we want to go? Uh, We can go back just to the beginning of of this millennium, okay, to uh, Twin Towers, for example. And uh, President Bush's question, why do they hate us? Well, that question has never been seriously asked. And yet it seems to me that Twin Towers, Arab Spring, uh, all that's happened in between time and currently, the Black Lives Matter uh, and the indigenous uh, um, and, of course, not only indigenous, but um, white and and colored people's uh, protests around the Keystone Pipeline, for example. There's activism all over the world in a in a different way, I think, than it was 40 years ago. So the question is, I think some, well, what's happening on the planet? Why is it happening? I think that's where the great change is happening. And I think that's partly the challenge that we have to find a way to adapt to. COVID-19 and isolation and lockdown has uh, caused us to adapt. Adapt is a big word for young. And uh, he says, you know, we have to adapt to the world we're born into. Fair enough. And usually that's the task of the first part of life, however long that is, you know, getting our feet on the ground, earning our keep, getting away from parents, uh, maybe children and rearing them, profession, training and all that. But at a certain point, when that's more or less in place, then uh, the focus it needs to shift more to, or the emphasis shift more to adaptation to what we are, that we have not been able to, for one reason or another, access, manifest, uh, develop. Now, individuation is used in, in various senses. So right now, the world is certainly uh, in a turmoil, and things are changing. And uh, we've adapted, we've adapted the analyst training program to a hybrid model. And we'll, we'll probably go forward with some mixture of uh, in-person meetings and online classes and discussions. How does the content change? Well, I think one of the things that's changed more, we've been aware of more, is uh, the phenomenon of cultural complex there was a Founders Day a few years ago focused on the cultural complex. Okay, not only do people have complexes, not only do complexes have people, complexes have cultures. You know, typical 
patterns that are emotionally charged. So going forward, I think that, uh, at least for me, the, the challenge is to stay close to primary experience while trying to understand it. Yeah. So the primary experience would be uh, one's own experience? That's a start, yeah. But also your experience, which may be different from mine in some ways. So you've been practicing uh, as an analyst for several years now. And what to you has been most gratifying about your work as an analyst? And, and, and let me add, as a Jungian analyst. Huh. Well, that's the only kind of analyst I am, so I can't speak for any other kind of analyst. But what uh, the teaching has been really gratifying as has the clinical work with the clients and with, with the analytic trainees, candidates. Um, I've always uh, want, always enjoyed, always found it valuable to take a text and go through it fairly carefully. And part of me has said, oh, we should be moving along faster. So there's been that tension between... Um, we really get through this paragraph and get something out of it. Uh, but what about the rest of the chapter that was assigned for this class period? So that's a tension that I haven't resolved. Um, with the clients, my particular practice has been with people who um, have some degree of adaptation to the world. Okay. So I'm not talking about um, dropouts, isolates, uh, you know, the kids that are 30 years old and still living with their parents. Although there are analysts who can work with them. Um, but what I find particularly valuable is, uh, are those minutes when um, talking with the client, the clients talking with me and the, uh, the tone of our interchange, the voice quality, the energy quality shifts. And uh, we've gotten to something that uh, was not obvious, but that is uh, touching, moving, uh, can bring tears to the eyes um, because it's somehow uh, a moment of great importance uh, for both of us. And so that's a level of, of intimacy in this formal analytic setting uh, that, frankly, sur far surpasses most of the most other human interchanges for me. So Carl Jung believed that uh, the more background you could bring to to the process of analysis as a psychotherapist, uh, the richer that kind of, that the experience could be. And that, that's what I'm hearing from you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he had a lot of respect for people who came to it from different professions. Like, let's say, for instance, they, they had a background in literature or mythology or mm -hmm. um, art, right. um, some some it may be something that would be expressive or um, scientific even because that would enrich the whole process. So do you find that um, people who come into your program from different backgrounds, how, how do they get integrated in and, and kind of rooted? It's a big question, isn't it? Like how, how do you gather all of these various um, people with their backgrounds and, and give a, a holistic experience out of the training. Well, I hope we give a holistic experience out of the training. Okay. That's certainly um, desirable. All the people who train in Chicago at the, are at the Young Institute in the analyst training program already have satisfied uh, the 
collective in terms of the uh, educational and licensing and practice uh, experience requirements that exist wherever they happen to live. If they live in Illinois, then they have to deal with the regulations in Illinois, if it's Indiana, Wisconsin, or Nevada, or wherever. Okay. So that's the adaptation, if you will, to the collective. And it can be a degree in clinical social work, psychiatric nursing, uh, clinical psychology, PhD or PsyD, um, pastoral counseling, just a lot of ways in. But it's a, the requirement is considerable, so pretty good experience and um, able to operate legally. Okay. So they come from different backgrounds. But I think maybe one of the common, uh, what shall I say, grounds is that there is a, a respect for what comes into awareness from outside of awareness, from the unconscious. Okay. And um, what else? That's maybe the beginning, you know, and then perhaps also the idea that um, something is uh, coming to me in the form of a dream or a fantasy or or an image that I have experienced or seen or a situation that I can't get rid of, and I need to fathom it. I need to to make sense of it. So with with that common interest. And what is this saying to me that's important for my life? Uh, then we can share. Uh, now, there's a lot of cognitive stuff, a lot of book learning that's involved. But there's also the more experiential uh, dimension, uh, whether it's... Um, as currently this year, a colleague and I are taking the first two hours of the, of the weekend with the candidates and it's, uh, bring, bring an image, bring a symbol that's meaningful to you. Talk about it. And we go around and, uh, interestingly, um, everybody's image, um, is obviously important to them, but it turns out that, uh, Somebody else's image elaborates uh, whatever image or symbol I have brought. And you also asked about the the value of of a wide range of background. Uh, It does seem to be true that uh, Psyche will present us with dreams that don't make any sense in terms of day residue or my current life situation, but rather bring up uh, themes that uh, only make sense if one knows uh, literature, something of literature, something of religious tradition, something of mythology. Yeah. Right. So what other attributes do you think go into, you know, making a good analyst? Are there, are there other traits that you see in analysts who go through your program and really thrive professionally? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Jung says uh, something which is uh, profoundly true, that it's the person of the analyst that makes the difference. Now, what does that mean? Uh, what that to me means is that it's not the person's theory particularly uh, or uh, the person's uh, uh, formal training even, but something about uh, that person has in some way matured for want of better terms. Okay, there's, a, of course, an ability to listen, receptivity, a a receptivity that can actually resonate with what the other person is saying. So uh, I think, I think analysts practiced somewhat differently. I would like to think that we fundamentally share uh, a 
um, the same skeleton, uh, cognitive or, or intellectual skeleton or, you know, how, how we think things work. But um, what does that mean that it's the person of the analyst that makes the difference? So one of the things that needs to happen uh, in training, which includes, you know, personal analysis, ongoing personal analysis and consultation with the senior analyst, is that that uh, the analyst in training calibrates himself or herself, calibrate in the sense of uh, I have a strength here and I don't have as much strength there, or I get thrown off my uh, my pace uh, by this uh, complex, or uh, that's a blind spot, you know, or um, typically I rush in where angels fear to tread, you know. And, even though I know it, I don't know it until afterwards, time it again. And that's that's part of calibration, knowing how the instrument, the analytic instrument, which is the person, actually functions. And that's an ongoing uh, calibration, recalibration. It sounds like an alchemical uh, takeoff, ripoff, but anyway. <laughs> but it also sounds like someone really needs to come in understanding themselves. Having insight in, into their own uh, abilities and their strengths, and if if I understand, also it's a matter of uh, having done some analysis themselves. Uh, right. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, well, first of all, uh, it's a process that is never finished of calibrating oneself. Um, I've been doing this, as you said, for several years. And, uh, just, uh, recently, um, I had to recognize in a new way that, uh, part of me is naive. And that part that is naive is around an idea that for me is so resplendent, so clear, so obviously important. Explain so very much. So what I do is rush in with the idea, naively, uh, expecting to be warmly received. And people sort of say, huh? <laughs> so I obviously have not done a good job. I have not been aware of other people maybe not being as enthusiastic about that particular point of view as I am. And of course I end up hurt and disappointed. So uh, people have to know something about themselves. Yes. But even more than, well, that's part of it. But I think the willingness to continue to learn about oneself is crucial. That kind of, that kind of openness. And that kind of openness really requires um, that a person feel pretty solid in herself or in himself, okay? That uh, nobody's going to be able totally to shoot the ground out from under one's feet. And then a willingness to to, uh, continue learning, not just out of books, but learning from each other, learning about oneself through contact with the other. So... I'm wondering, because you have such great perspective, you know, you've got a breadth of knowledge about Jung, understanding of what it takes to become a good analyst, and you've been a teacher as well. So you have, I'm guessing, real insight into what the future of psychoanalysis is. What, it, what do you see for the future of the profession? Can't speak for people trained in other psychoanalytic traditions, or at least not extensively. But uh, the fact is that uh, around the world, there are developing groups uh, in Central Asia, in China, in India, okay, in South America, 
these are uh, developing groups of, of, of people, often, you know, younger than our trainees, who uh, have discovered Jung in one way or the other and are learning to be analysts. Uh, there is a hunger out there, definitely. There's a hunger in this country. If you go on the Internet and put up Jung, you're going to find it. A lot coming through. A lot of it, of course, is Jung's name taken in vain. All right, that's part of it. But there is really good stuff out there, too, uh, on the web. So uh, I have no doubt that uh, somewhere in the world, lots of places in the world, people will be studying, developing the skills to do analytic work. Union analytic work. I hope that we can work things out in the States so that younger people uh, can get in. I get uh, inquiries, you know, what does it take? You know, how much analysis, analysis beforehand? You know, how long is it? Those kinds of things. And these are rating, these sound like young people who are eager. So, uh, Jung's discoveries are not going to go away. They're just not going to go away. And there are people who find them and say, oh, I've got to learn more about this. I've got to figure out how to do this. So if you were starting out, if you were one of those young querents, yeah, reaching out and saying, oh, gosh, I, I really want to dig into Jung and I want to be an mm-hmm. analyst in the Jungian tradition. If you were could take yourself back, what... What would you pursue with a passion now? Well, I'd have to be a different person than I am or than I was. But given that, okay, um, I tried to get into training just like you did in the past. Uh, in other know, words, don't do wait too necessary. long. Yeah, don't wait too long. Don't wait too long. Uh, yes. If you're interested, pursue it. Uh, right. it's, you know, pursue the individual analysis, uh, take classes, read, uh, work it, you know, right. uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of a chronic situation, you know, one gets infected and we have a yeah. chronic uh, situation on our it's hands. It's hard to shake, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't shake, uh, at least for me. And, uh, and part of it is, you know, that, we, we scrape down through so much conditioning. And that's uh, simply the way it is. Wherever we're born and, and uh, reared, we are conditioned uh, by that environment. And that conditioning uh, is intended to help us adapt to that particular situation. Okay, some of it may not be as necessary as uh, as the culture thinks it is, but okay. But that's part of the big challenge of life is to recognize that the the way that I was shaped as a young person is really a misshaping of who I really am. I eventually want to be who I really can be. And that's a tough one, you know, especially if somebody gets to 35 or 40 or 50 and realize that they've been living a split life or a half truth. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Right. Yes. And usually I'm guessing, I mean, I I know that this was the case for me when I turned to the C.G. Jung Institute in Chicago. I was I was having dreams. I was having very apocryphal, very uh, unshakable dreams. And so I think there's something inside of us that wants to be realized um, when we begin to get curious about. Carl Jung's work and his approach to analysis. And that leads me to want to ask if, if somebody's out there right now listening to this and they're curious about the analyst training program at the C.G. Jung Institute in Chicago, what should they do next? Well, if they want to know about what we're offering, they go on the website, jungchicago.org and click on the tab that says education and see what's being offered. If they want more than that, then they will contact uh, the director of training, currently me, for the analyst training program, or 
any other director of a program uh, who was listed there. And uh, that's kind of the beginning, you know, or look for a local Jungian group, go online and see what you can find. That's interesting. Great. And get into analysis personally. Yes, because uh, there are hours of analysis that are required if you want to pursue the training. So in other words, you're undergoing Jungian analysis with a trained Jungian analyst at the same time as you're learning how to do it yourself. And as a matter of fact, uh, the requirement for the analyst training program is 100 hours of personal analysis before the application deadline. Right. So that's a great place to begin. It is. And the reason for that is that hopefully personal analysis will help the eager person get some idea of what's involved, a taste of it personally. And, you know, one of the things that was said in my training and is still true, what's very important is how we know, how we came to know what we do know. Okay. How do you know what you really know? Probably not primarily from a book. Well, that's a great place to end. And this has been really a, a delight. So For me I wanna, too. Good. Wonderful. I, I want to thank you. And I also want to say that anyone who is interested in learning more about the offerings at the C.G. Jung in, Institute, um, you can go to www.jungchicago.org. And thanks again, Boris. My pleasure. Thank you. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org. Thank you to our 2019 supporter-level donors, Bill Alexi, Usha and Ashok Beatty, Circle Center Yoga, Arlo and Rena Kampan, Eric Cooper and Judith Cooper, Lorna Crowell, D. Scott Dayton, George J. Didier, The Cole Family Foundation, Rama Krishnan and Full Bloom Lotus, Suzanne G. Rosenthal, Deborah Stutzman, Deborah Tobin, Alexander Wayne and Lynn Kopp, and Gerald Weiner. If you would like to support this podcast, just go to youngchicago.org slash give.